This is Logan Spence, and this is Particularism, a rhetorical perspective. Please take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. So my name is Logan Spence, and I do go, be doing something a little bit different here. So I am um, a PhD student in communication studies, and I study rhetoric and rhetorical theory. So I am not here necessarily to argue in fa favor of rationalism or philosophical concepts. Instead, what I'm interested in is examining rhetorical persuasiveness and how um, people use persuasive messaging to convince an audience to believe in a particular thing. And what I am here to do is advocate for particularism, as my title argues, from a rhetorical perspective, how rhetoric and rhetorical theory can help us highlight the contradictions found in a lot of generalist presumptions and how particularism can be best brought about through the rhetoric of conspiracy theories and conspiracy theory discourse. And so begin as what many have already um, illustrated earlier, that particularism versus generalism, where generalism asserts that conspiracy theories are prima facie irrational and that scholars ought to dismiss them because they are conspiracy theories, whereas particularism argues that we need to engage with them on an individual merit based on their evidence, arguments, and logic. If it's a good conspiracy theory, it's accepted. If it is a bad conspiracy theory, we trash it. And while academic literature in particularism is very rich, it's overwhelmingly representative by philosophy with a couple of sociologists um, um, and, and political theorists here and there. So I wanted to kind of introduce rhetoric and rhetorical theory into the field and kind of examine uh, particularism and generalism through a rhetorical lens. Specifically, I want to examine how the state relies upon its own ethos to spread conspiracy theories as official theories without the population reading them as a conspiracy theory. In my analysis, I will be examining former Prime Minister Tony Blair's March 18th, 2003 speech to the Commons and how he used the state's ethos to push a conspiracy theory and justify the Iraq War. I argue that Tony Blair's conspiratorial justification for the Iraq War was not read by the British public as a conspiracy theory because Blair, as head of the British state, relied upon the manufactured ethos of the state to dress his conspiracy theory up as an endorsed explanation which allowed him to conflate political authority with epistemic authority. So a common assertion among generalists and some particulars here and there is that conspiracy theorists are, de are defined by their opposition to official theories, explanations from the state or relative relevant in institutions. However, the officialness of a theory or explanation does not mean that it is supported by evidence or that it is not a conspiracy theory. As M illustrates, that official and conspiracy theories are often evaluated by two broad characterizations, sneering and endorsed. Official theories are explanations that are endorsed by the state, and that endorsement constructs a perception of warrantability or accuracy by the public. However, the endorsement itself is simply an endorsement by political institutions, which is not the same as epistemic authority. While not the case in every situation, political authority can endorse a official authority because it serves the interests of the state rather than being epistemically correct. As Charles Pidgeon asserts, the state and its authority over, over official explanations institutes a deontological commitment to conventional wisdom, which encourages people to sneer at the mere mention of a conspiracy theory and presume that the official nar uh, narrative or theory is that which must be accepted almost as a, as a duty. And so Charles Pidgeon also argues that people do not control their beliefs because they are either moved by the evidence or they are not. As Jenny Rice asserts, ev how evidence is used and understood is best explained by rhetoric because the rhetor uses evidence in creative ways to convince the audience to be persuaded by a particular position. Aristotle defined um, ethos as the evaluation of the speaker's character and credibility to the audience. The credibility of the speaker allows the speaker to speak as if they are the authority on the subject, even if they are not. The state's endorsement constructs an ethos for the official theory because the state itself presupposes its own credibility for the country's population. The endorsement itself is often confused for epistemic authority because the state controls the majority of the nation's information, and that control allows the state to determine the structuring and distribution of information and its ethos. 
Moreover, since the average citizen has little to no access to the state's information or how they gather that information, they have little room to challenge the state's epistemic claims, even if the information is itself flawed or incorrect. Palakis and Goodnight, in my field, defined conspiracy theory rhetoric as the rhetorical battle to ground epistemic discourse between the pragmatist and the fantastical. One group will claim that the other group is engaging in a conspiracy, and the other will dispute that claim as mere fantasy. The winner of that rhetorical battle is the agent which determines the epistemic framing of discourse. Those that win are seen as the pragmatic, or seen as pragmatic, while the loser is seen as one who resides within the realm of fantasy. The conflation within the generalist literature of political and epistemic authority rests upon the rhetorical battle over determining the epistemology of discourse. The pragmatist's victory is the rhetorical battle in the rhetorical battle provides them with the ethos needed to assert any epistemic claim, regardless of its validity. The state presupposes its own victory over the conspiracy theorist with its endorsement of the official theory and can masquerade as an epistemic authority figure on the subject. Since the, state endorses, in, since the state's endorsement of an official theory is premised upon the state's ethos, the state can use conspiracy theories as its official explanation without the audience reading it as a conspiracy theory. If the state were to be, use a conspiracy theory as its official theory, the state can use its presupposed ethos to conflate its political authority with epistemic authority. The state can invade the fantasy of conspiracy theory rhetoric or the perceived fantasy of conspiracy theory rhetoric and remain with, um, within the perceived pragmatism because of its constructed ethos. So Slavov Zizek, relying on Lacan, defined the big other as the closed, totalized system which acts as the mediation of our public behavior. The subject presupposes the big other as the a priori appearances that motivate and move the subject to act in particular ways without question. The big other constitutes the rules for what the subject cannot do and certain appearances and performances that the subject who has committed themselves to the big other is expected to act upon without question. The big other functions as the Lacanian ego ideal because it becomes the nodal point from which the subject feels they are being evaluated. For instance, to be an American as the big other constitutes certain appearances that the citizen subject is expected to follow to maintain that appearance. If the American subject were to break those rules or appearances in public around other American citizens, the violating American citizen will feel the weight of the big other's judgment because the big other now knows about the violation. The state acts as the big other because its control over political, economic, and social policy positions the citizen subject to see the state as the nodal point from which their appearances are being evaluated within the symbolic order. The state, as the big other, constitutes the citizen subject, but that constitution can only occur if the state itself possessed a tremendous amount of rhetorical ethos to carry the ideological weight of the ego ideal or the big other. By using the, its rhetorical ethos, the, st the state determines how the citizen subject sees themselves as subjects to the big other and how to act in accordance to those committed a priori appearances. In Barbara B. Secker's rhetorical analysis of the Bush administration's justification for the Iraq war, she demonstrates that the Bush administration used the melancholic affect to convince the American citizen subject to demand the invasion under the premise that it will protect the idealized vision of America. And for Biesecker, she defines the melancholic as the feeling of loss or as if the object cause of desire is being robbed from them. And while Biesecker's analysis does not explicitly refer to the Secretary of State Colin Powell's press conference speech as a conspiracy theory, her use of the melancholic demonstrates how the state can use conspiracy theories as its official theory to exploit its ethos as the big other and constitute it, its uh, people as citizen subjects to motivate them into political action. The state can use the feeling of loss from some co conspiratorial forces to motivate the citizen subjects to feel further connected to the big other and the ego ideal and act or demand particular political action to prevent the loss from that con conspiratorial force. The American citizen subjects did not read Powell's speech as a conspiracy theory because he represented the ethos of the state, which led to the conflation of political authority and epistemic authority. Powell was misread by the politi American public as an epistemic authority figure rather than as a political authority figure because his ethos as, as a high representative of the state allowed the American public to see the conspiracy theory only as an official theory. 
the endorsement of the official theory occludes its conspiratorial elements. In my rhetorical analysis, I will demonstrate how Tony Blair's speech to the Commons uses the rhetoric of conspiracy theories as the head of the British state to control the epistemic discourse surrounding the Iraq War. Moreover, I will showcase how Blair's justification and official explanation uses the melancholic affect to push a conspiracy theory as a method of constituting political will among British citizen subjects to, project, to pro, uh, protect the big other. Through this, I will illustrate how these rhetorical flourishes create an institutionalized ethos that allows Blair in, to conflate political and epistemic authority. The official narrative of the Iraq war was premised upon a conspiracy theory, but the British state was initially able to avoid accusations of conspiracy theorizing because its rhetorical construction of its ethos allowed it to assert a political explanation while masquerading as an epistemic authoritative explanation. So Prime Minister Tony Blair opens his speech by illustrating the political horrors of Saddam Hussein, and I'm just quoting him. I accept fully that those that oppose to this course of action, the invasion of Iraq, share my detestation of Saddam. Who could not? Iraq is a potentially wealth is a, is a potentially wealthy country that in 1979, the year before Saddam came into power, was richer than Portugal and Malaysia. Today, it is impoverished. Blair continues, the brutality of oppression, the death and torture, the barbaric and uh, political opponents, routine beatings of anyone or, or their families suspected of disloyalty, all of that is well documented. Blair draws up an anecdote to back up his claims. I recall a few weeks ago talking to an Iraqi exile, saying to her that I understood our group must be under the, uh, the lashes span, but that, but you don't, uh, but you don't, she replied, you can't. You do not know what it, is, what it is to live in perpetual fear. Blair connects that sentiment with British freedom. She is right. We take our freedom for granted. But imagine not to be able to speak or discuss or debate or even question the society you live in, to see friends and family taken away and never daring to complain. That is how Iraqi people live. After establishing the political horrors of Saddam Hussein, Tony Blair addresses the British politicians and pundits who were against the war. This house now demands, and this is the choice before us, if this house now demands that at this moment faced with, great, with this threat from this regime, the British troops are pulled back that we turn away at the point of reckoning, and this, is, and this is what it means. What then? What will Saddam feel? Strengthen beyond measure. What will the other, what will the other states who tyrannize their people, the terrorists who threaten our existence, what will they take from that? that the will confronting them is decaying and feeble. Who will celebrate and who will weep if we take our troops back from the Gulf now? Blair paints the terrors of the Hussein regime and how it treats its people as a pretext for the potential of what could happen to England if England refuses to in invade Iraq. The oppression of Iraq serves as a melancholic fear for the British public who sees that oppression as a violation of the British big other. When Blair says that the British citizens take freedom for granted, he is speaking as the big other because the citizen subjects are expected to see Blair, the head of the state, as the nodal point from which they are being evaluated. The freedoms of England are presupposed as the natural element of the British big other to which British, British citizens are expected to perform to maintain their commitment to those a priori appearances. Blair's melancholic rhetoric constitutes the citizen subjects to engage in political action the invasion of Iraq, to protect the big other from the fundamental loss from a conspiratorial force. The Saddam Hussein regime is a malevolent force that is attempting to undermine the democracy and liberalism of the West, and the British must take a stand to prevent that subversion. Blair's emphasis on the potential harm from a retreat becomes an implicit condemnation of his political opponents, who are characterized as dupes to the conspiracy. If the anti-war politicians had their way, they are insinuating that they are in favor of Saddam, Saddam Hussein robbing England for, of their natural freedoms. The subversion is external as well as from within. The only way to prevent that conspiratorial subversion is to engage in the war. While Blair is explicitly endorsing a conspiracy theory as the official theory of the state, the British public did not read it as a conspiracy theory because the speech was initially met with overwhelming praise and support from the British government. The public conflated Blair's political authority with the epistemic authority of foreign policy experts in the region because Blair was relying upon the ethos of the state and his position within the state to carry the conspiracy theory's weight. 
Blair spoke as the credible source because he is speaking as the head of the British state and that ethos allows him to endorse the conspiracy theory without the public recognizing it as a conspiracy theory. That endorsement is what makes the conspiracy theory not seen as a conspiracy theory, but as the official theory. The endorsement is what allows the public to make this conflation because it is functioning on a presupposed ethos. So by examining Tony Blair's 2003 speech to the Commons about the invasion of Iraq, I illustrated the rhetorical element of generalism that particularists have been critiquing for a long time. The conflation of epistemic and political authorities is unconsciously prevalent among generalists because of their obsession over relying upon experts to determine epistemic knowledge claims. Blair's speech indicates the flawed thinking of generalism, which hyperfixates on epistemic claims made by political institutions and how those institutions rhetorically exploit that conflation to further their own conspiratorial ends. The philosophical presumption of generalism in academia and political discourse prevents audiences and scholars from, from recognizing speech texts from the state as conspiracy theories because of their privileging of the official theory. I believe rhetoric and rhetorical theory is uniquely positioned to address the contradictions of generalism and actions because it allows scholars to demonstrate the consequences of generalist presumption and how they can be rhetorically exploited by those in power. Rhetoric also allows us to see how the state could exploit generalist naivety to hide the conspiracy theory in plain sight, disguised as an official theory. And that's it. I do. I had to unmute myself there. Excellent. Thank you. We've already got two questions. Uh, so we'll start with Kurt. Why England? Was that the language the PM used? I thought England, Wales, and Scotland were indivisible on defense. Or am I getting lost nitpicking a synonym for the UK? Yeah, it's it, when I say, yeah, if, if, I remember, if I remember correctly, the, the majority of the support seemed to have come from England, but uh, Scotland, um, Wales, and Northern, Northern Ireland were not as supportive of it as the as the mainland of England. So yeah, so I'm referring specifically to like mostly England. Yes, it is true that the United Kingdom is nowhere near as united politically yeah. as maybe Westminster would like to claim it is. Yeah. Uh, see, for example, the threat of a new Scottish referendum on leaving the so-called United Kingdom. Melina asks, super interesting talk, thanks. I was wondering if you see a difference between how the media has used conspiracy theory rhetoric between when the official story was made by Trump and was a conspiracy theory, example, the voting election fraud story in 2020, leading to Jan 6th, and for example, other official stories, i.e. conspiracy theories made today by the US government about the Russia-Ukraine -Ukra cr crisis. And she adds, I think Logan might have hinted at it at the end, but it was a bit fast for my early brain. So if you'd just like to expand a bit, that would be nice. Let me, so let me reread it one more time. So I was wondering if you see a difference between how the media has used conspiracy between when the official and other stories, uh, and the other official stories. I think, um, so one of the things that I noticed like with American media is there, there kind of, there seems to be this kind of like, with the Trump administration regarding the 2020 presidential election, the voting for, or the big lie is initially American media seem to be very hesitant on calling it a conspiracy theory because it puts the media kind of in this weird, awkward position where they have to like, because technically the president of the United States is explicitly talking about a conspiracy. And it's not one that's because like, well, as I demonstrated here with like Tony Blair's speech, Tony Blair was able to kind of hide the conspiracy theory in plain sight through like very rhetorical flourishes, whereas Donald Trump spoke in a way that wasn't even pretending to not be conspiratorial. So initially, the American media seemed to be very hesitant on kind of calling it um, uh, a conspiracy theory because it was like this, like, OK, well, the president and a lot of the people within his administration are are advocating for this but that's conflicting with pretty much every other um institution of the government so it was so initially they were hesitant on calling that but over time i think from what i've seen so far from like cnn msnbc it seems that the media is now more comfortable calling the big lie a conspiracy theory um for the um um 
uh, on behalf of, against the Trump administration because um, it, uh, he's no longer part of the state. It's actually really interesting how they were willing to call it a conspiracy theory after he was removed from the White House. Now that he's no longer in the White House, now it's being considered a conspiracy theory because it's no longer being supported unanimously or split within the state. Um, but as for the official theories regarding Russia and Ukraine, uh, I can't really speak on that too much, mo mostly because I just haven't been paying attention to that situation. So it's, I think there's a interesting case here now with what happened with the invasion of Iraq back in 2003. So I don't know whether you followed the two podcasts that de dealt with the lead up to that inv inv invasion, Blowback Season 1, which was very much a, these are the lying lies who got us into the lying, lying war. And then Slow Burn, I think, Season 4, which ended up being kind of an apologetics for the invasion of Iraq, at least from the American side, going, well, you know, uh, Bush and Blair, they were, they were just tragically misinformed. And all the people in the administration, they were simply relying on the wrong expert or overweighing particular bits of evidence. And yeah, there's some evidence of malign acting, but really that was outside the norm. Most of the people involved in the invasion really did legitimately think there was a reason for concern. So it seems that in the intervening period, a scary thing to think it's almost 20 years since that invasion now, there are now people who are acting as apologists for the thing that people quite clearly saw as being open conspiratorial politics back at that point, point in time. It's, 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 it's as if the big lie, as long as some people like Blair maintained it, people were eventually going to believe it. Yeah. And I, I actually, so as I was working on this, I actually read a bunch of academic literature on foreign policy. And there was one, there was a, um, there was a particular um, uh, article that, because uh, apparently a, a, a fairly recent report uh, came out that was like super, super condemnatory of um, the Blair administration. And um, they, um, this one, I forgot the person's name, but basically they were examining like the morals of punishing Tony Blair and his administrators or whatnot. And it was very strange because it would, it almost came across as like kind of abusing leftist or progressive um, perspective regarding um, uh, rehabilitation. So when, when progressives and leftists talk about how we need to rehabilitate criminals rather than just punishing them. So like if someone like robs a store or something, they should be they should give the opportunity to, you know, learn why that's wrong or uh, give them an opportunity to not commit something like that again. And this one academic article that I was reading was basically kind of making a quasi similar argument for Tony Blair that actually we shouldn't punish Tony Blair um, uh, punitively because uh, he was just working under material conditions that he uh, he actually believed in the conspiracy theory that he that um, that he was engaging in. And that um, uh, that th like it's that it's impossible to prove maliciousness. So and, and this was an article that was published like a year ago. Um, so, it, yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, apology. And it seems like um, like it, it almost seems like people are willing to make apologies depending on how distant the um, how distant the conspiracy happened. So we're like. Um, like right now, pretty much everyone in America is like united against like the big, I say not everyone, but like not non-Republicans are mostly united against like the big lie. Um, but there's a pretty good chance that people might start engaging in like apologia, um, uh, was, uh, apologia for Trump, even on like the liberal side, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, where uh, all the liberal apologists start to come in and start like explaining why we shouldn't punish those who engaged in it because that would be punitive. We don't want to be punitive. So yeah, so I, I think it's I think it's largely dependent on how far back did the conspiracy happen. It almost sounds as if they're doing the Tony Blair was just following all. all orders defense that people use back in the in. 
World War II to explain why people did the things that they did. Uh, Kurt also asks, has a real reason or official story ever emerged for the invasion of Iraq back in 2003? Well, that's going to depend on if, if you're talking about England or America, because America, it was always about, um, quote unquote, um, uh, uh, what was it like? Put, I think Bush infamously said planting the seed of democracy into Iraq, um, which of course was nonsense. He was he was obviously lying. Um, so like the official story from the American perspective was to take down the Saddam Hussein regime and instill a, a dem democratic system um, uh, uh, into um, Iraq um, and uh, and and saving the uh, the Iraqi people. Um, so that was that was the the official story, at least from from, you know, America's perspective. But that had kind of changed near the end of the Bush uh, Bush's second term when it became very apparent that they lied. There's also, I think, a ambiguity here in official story between a story as espoused by an element of the state and the accepted history of the event after the fact. So the official story at the time of the invasion from the, the UK perspective is weapons of mass destruction. The accepted story now is that was based upon a doctored dossier, but there are still members of the Labour Party who still maintain that, you know, people had good reason to believe that dossier was true. So there's no official story in the sense of a state authorized or sanctioned one, mm -hmm. but there is the accepted history, which is the quasi official one. It gets us into the wonderful ambiguity. Uh, Kurt also asked a question which you, you may not actually be in a position to answer. I doubt Tony Blair was innocent, but what about the Australians? Because, of course, famously, it was the US, the UK, and Australia who engaged in that invasion. Almost all the other Western powers went, no, thank you, we'll, we'll, we'll pass on this particular one. Were the Australians innocent, or were they, were they complicit in, in the big lie? So, Em, you are correct. I can't answer that, because I totally forgot Australia was part of that until you said that. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. And, and the only answer I can give as as a New Zealander is that the position that most New Zealanders had at the time was, Australia may not know what's going on, but they're really keen to do whatever the UK and the US are doing. So they will they will essentially be their lapdogs in any invasion. So you can imagine a situation where Australians really don't know whether there are we weapons of mass destruction, but if America is going to invade, we're going to join in. Uh, and that might just be New Zealand's uh, view of, of Austra Australia uh, writ large. Uh, Jinnah has a interesting comment in the chat. Uh, the economic motive was hiding in plain sight. Two weeks after the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, President Bush articulated the importance of oil as during the deployment of troops. It was about your own nat national security interests and peace and stability. We're also talking about maintaining access to energy resources that, that are key, not just to the functioning of this country, but to the entire world, the president said. Our jobs, our way of life, our freedom, and the freedom of friendly countries around the world will all suffer if control all the world's great oil reserves fell into the hands of Saddam Hussein, he declared. Uh, so yes, as Jenna points out, the economic motive really was hiding in plain sight. And, it, and, it, and it's using that, that um, melancholic rhetoric as illustrated by Barbara Biesecker, the idea that, um, um, that this feeling of loss as if something is being robbed from us. And so the state can use its ethos as the arbiter of the big other um, to, um, to kind of like convince the public to motivate them into a political action. We have to invade Iraq to protect the oil reserves because without those oil reserves, then Saddam Hussein gets to take away our freedoms, right? Um, it, was, it kind of reminds me of when, when France refused to participate in uh, the Iraq invasion or the Iraq war. And there were a bunch of like restaurants in America, um, um, that were changing their their uh, menus that said French fries to freedom fries, right? Because it was like 
th like the idea of like ref like when Germany, France, all these European nations refused to participate in the Iraq War because they knew it. There was nothing to justify the the invasion. They um, America like took real big issue with that because it what it's not just that they um they that they're not uh, helping us to you know stop Saddam Hussein, but that they're going out of their way to. Uh, allow Saddam Hussein to take away American freedom. It's always that melancholic loss that's, that, that constitutes that political will. And it's able to do that through its ethos.